you know, and I think kids should understand that and learn that. But also giving them, like she said, giving them the space to cry, but also understanding that, you know, like like I tell some kids, once we get done crying, we got we got some things to take care of. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So um, it's okay to cry, um, but also just helping them find that balance with, okay, we're, we're crying, but we shouldn't allow the crying to stop us from trying to achieve what we're trying to achieve. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Okay. <clears throat> got a follow-up question. Okay. Where do you think the term, phrase, uh, stop crying if I get something to cry about comes from? <laughs> <laughs> Black trauma. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying, you know. I, I've heard it. Have y'all heard it's it? It's a good question. Yeah. All right, so where do you think A lot, a lot. <laughs> a lot. Stop crying if I get something to cry about. I think it's a perfect follow-up question to what mm-hmm. I just asked because, you know, when you say... Is it okay to let our kids cry? But then, you know, growing up, we was like, oh, stop crying before I give you something to cry about. So now, what mm-hmm. do I learn? I learned that. Hello, hello. We're back again, everyone, with another great episode of Speaking with Gravity. I am your host, Joshua. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Um, my name is Sienna Williams. And my name is Dominique Bond. You already know who I am. Terrence Dawkins. The one and only. That's one right. and only, yeah. Well, you got your James Bond thing going over, over there, ain't it? Boy, cool. Just, just seducing the mic like you was. I figured you was going to say something about that, too. <laughs> Y'all, we have some tension that's coming over from other episodes of this episode, but it's all love. Yeah, you know it's all love. Yeah, yeah. Ter- Terrence, Terrence, um, we're gonna let him keep seducing the mic all episode, man. <laughs> you already know. Uh, but but y'all, we got a we got a great uh, episode here today. We got a great special guest here today. He's already introduced himself, uh, Mr. Dominique Bond, with us here today. Uh, and today we're talking about uh, Roots of Resilience. We're talking about Roots of Resilience. Um, and I, I really feel like, well, we really feel like this is, uh, he's very fitted for this episode, right? Yeah. Um, so we want to give him uh, the space and time uh, to talk a little bit about just, you know, what he does, uh, the journey of how he got here, and uh, just how he's impacting uh, the people that he's impacting as well. I don't want to give too much. So, so, so uh, please, please take the mic, brother. Most definitely, man, and I'm, I'm excited to be here, man. It's going to be fun. Yes, yes. we're excited uh, My name is Dominique you. Bond. I'm a school counselor. Uh, I've been counseling for about five years. Mm-hmm. I'm currently a school counselor in middle school. Okay. So my, my little nieces and nephews, like I call them, keep me busy. Um, mm-hmm. And I just enjoy, you know, helping them out with different issues, different problems and so forth, whether it's <clears> family <throat> issues or issues inside the school system and so forth. Um, I also got a background in social work. Okay. Um, I started a youth program Beautiful. that provided um, workshops, youth workshops for the kids oh. for, for various different topics. And it's a great way to get the community involved and so forth to, you know, help out the youth and so forth. But I'm all about youth development, man, and um, mm-hmm. it's, it's fun. Good. That's exciting. I have one quick question. How is the middle school setting? We hear so much that middle schoolers are difficult to work with. Their, you know, their emotions are so different. How is the middle school environment? Just like you stated. <laughs> it's, okay, it's, it's, it's all over the place. Mm-hmm. You know, middle school, that age group, man, they finding themselves, they figuring mm-hmm. stuff out, puberty and so forth. So, you know, um, you know, moods mm-hmm. and emotions all, all over the place. So, you know, they, they need some guidance. They're trying to figure mm-hmm. things out. They're trying to um, find themselves out and so forth. And they got so many other things going on, too, that they're trying to deal with. So right. um, it, it is challenging at times. But I think for the most part, it's it's a good experience. Mm-hmm. I'm glad you asked that question, Hannah, because I got a question. All right. Because uh, the people want to know. What do they want to know? know? Yeah. The people want to know, should we just let our kids cry? Or is that really showing them how to regulate their emotions? And when is crying enough? So when is it enough for them to cry? I know that was kind of loaded. But should mm-hmm. we let our kids cry? When you say should we let them cry, do you mean like uncontrollably, mm-hmm. uncontrollably, without limits, um, without setting like you know, they crying for five minutes or ten minutes? All right, that's enough. So what do you mean? You tell. You take it how you want to. Mm. 
Do you want to start? No, go ahead. You, you want to write straight. I'll start by saying, as adults, we don't have someone that limits our crying. Mm-hmm. We're able to have the freedom to cry when we want to cry, you know, in the car, at home, in the bathroom. You might even choose not to cry at all. That's our options, um, and that's our freedom to make that choice. As adults, I feel like we should give children that same freedom to cry, Mm -hmm. to express their emotions when they're sad, when they're upset. Um, I don't feel like we should limit that. However, I feel like we should help them process that crying. So um, I don't feel like we should put limitations and say, oh, stop crying, you know, you're too loud. But we should more so nurture that side of them um, that's sad or that may be upset and see where that emotion comes from and help them process it. Mm -hmm. So I would say nurture them instead of um, stopping it. Mm -hmm. I agree. Crying is a human reaction, you know, and I think kids should understand that and learn that. But also giving them, like she said, giving them the space to cry, but also understanding that, you know, like, like I tell some kids, once we get done crying, we got we got some things to take care of. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So um, it's okay to cry, um, but also just helping them find that balance with, okay, we're, we're crying, but we shouldn't allow the crying to stop us from trying to achieve what we're trying to achieve. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Okay. <clears throat> got a follow-up question. Okay. Where do you think the term, phrase, uh, Stop crying for I get something to cry about comes from. <laughs> Black trauma. <laughs> I'm just I'm just saying, you know. I, I've heard it. Have y'all heard it's it? A good question. Heard it all yeah. Time. All right, so where you a lot, it a lot. <laughs> a lot. Stop crying for I get you something to cry about. And I think it's a perfect follow up question to what mm-hmm. I just asked because, you know, when you say is it okay to let our kids cry, but then, you know, growing up we was oh stop crying before I give you something to cry about. So now what mm-hmm. do I learn? I learned that it's not okay for me to cry or show this type of emotion. So why why do you think that all started? Well about happened? that particular thing too, right? Yeah. Cry mm-hmm. about that particular thing. Yeah, a particular like, si- uh, yeah. situation, experience, uh, but, but like it's whatever. some it's something else you you you, you know. Yeah. It, it's it's something else that you should be crying about. <laughs> exactly. Uh uh-huh. Like you shouldn't be crying about this. So what did right. I, what did I learn about? Oh, this is not okay to cry about, right? So that's, that's a good point. That's a really good question and I feel like not only does it allow us to think, but it allows our audience to start thinking, too. Um, Have you said that question? If so, where did that question come from? And to me, I feel like that question um, or that statement is said because as an adult, we don't value the place that that child is crying from. We don't know their reasoning. Um, And if we do know their reasoning, you know, they may be crying because they dropped their toy. To us as an adult, that may not be valuable. We might have a bill that's passed due, so we want to cry about that while this child is simply crying. And I don't even want to say simple because that's big to them. Mm -hmm. So I feel like as adults, we just prioritize, um, we just prioritize differently. I was going to say, I think you bring up a really great point, Hannah. I think sometimes, even I've probably been guilty of this, is, um, is, you know, when, when the child is crying, me just kind of thinking about not looking bad, me not looking bad, right? So if the child, if my child crying in the store, I don't want everybody looking at me, mm-hmm. right? Or if we in church, mm-hmm. I don't want everybody to turn around looking at me. So I'm thinking about myself. I'm not even thinking mm-hmm. about the child and trying to understand why they're crying. It is something that I that I try to be intentional about, though I'll say that. Mm-hmm. But um, it's like that, that, that impulse, that instinct of, oh, man, everybody going to be looking, you know, going to be mm-hmm. looking around. Uh, So I'm looking at myself instead of looking at the one who's going through whatever they're going through. Mm -hmm. And I say that I I initially said black trauma because I've been guilty of that, too. And I feel like we let our ego and our pride Mm -hmm. um, overshadow the main concern at hand. And that's the child and their emotions. And why are they sad? It could be something simple. And it also could be something very serious. But we would never know until we dig a little deeper um, Mm -hmm. and just process process those emotions. Mm -hmm. And I think another thing that sometimes we don't mention is for for many of us, crying makes us feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. We feel like we have to dive in and just do something because they're crying. But if we can be honest with ourselves, you know, when we see the tears, it does make us feel uncomfortable. And then I think there's a misunderstanding with some parents. We want our kids to be tough. Mm -hmm. We have this misunderstanding of toughness. Especially our boys. Exactly. So when we're telling them to cry, we're just thinking that, you know what, this is going this is what's going to help them just get over, you know, yeah. get over the challenges and and um, you know, develop this sense of resiliency. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which 
Which takes us to our topic, Roots yep. of Resilience, Nurturing Emotional Regulation in Our Children. And the last point I want to say to that is that on the opposite side of not catering to our um addressing children's emotions is that child suppresses their emotions so we know you know history has shown that as a child specifically black black boys i want to speak about black boys they have been taught to suppress their emotions don't cry you know be tough be a man but what does that lead to long term suppressing those tears suppressing those emotions so i love that everything y'all said because it, it lets me know where do you think children are learning uh, where, uh, or keyword, not learning emotional regulation from. They're not learning it from their parents. Mm -hmm. So that means they're going to grow up to be able not to regulate their emotions at the same time, right? So when they have kids, what are they going to do? Same thing. So it's a generational uh, a generational thing that goes on where a cycle, right? Mm-hmm. And that's what I study personally is uh, generational trauma yeah. and why I'm wearing this good old hoodie. That's good. <laughs> you see it. What's it say? Oh, so, yeah. yeah. Generational cycle. That's generational right. Generational cycle break. Right? You got to break these cycles, mm-hmm. right? Because emotionally, uh, uh, people who are not able to regulate their emotions are going to grow up to do the same thing, right? Mm-hmm. So that's why I created cycles. these cards, right? These black trauma cards. <laughs> so these black trauma cards are mainly to try to give people language mm-hmm. to understand, hey, what am I going to say and how do I address my different uh, emotions and feelings, bring awareness to what they're feeling, and try to make connections to how they their experiences <clears throat> are impacting them moving forward so they can regulate their emotions mm-hmm. and things like that. So that makes a perfect thing. It's a cycle that continues to persist. Yeah. And so my, my mom or... My dad or grandmother probably didn't know how to regulate, regulate their emotions, so nobody taught me. I'm going to do the same thing. So, I got a question on that too, though. So, uh, if if you were in, in this family, right, and you see it, you see it as a cycle, but not only a cycle that's affecting you and your siblings, but it's affecting like your cousins, mm-hmm. and your uncles, aunts, all these. Like, how do you? Like, I know the change isn't made overnight, but. And I know that you educate people, right? But it just seems like, man, it's it can be a daunting task. It right? is. Mm-hmm. It very is very, so. very daunting. Yeah. But it starts with one person, right? Mm-hmm. So for me personally, once I started learning about this concept of intergenerational trauma, what I started to do was, just like as a kid, uh, a parent and a child, I would have wanted my parent to show me how to regulate my emotions, Mm -hmm. right? So what I try to do is I try to show my cousins or show my mom or show my sister. Does it always work? No, because they have to make the choice for themselves, right? right? But I can tell you it has been beneficial for the relationship between me and my mom because growing up, she never uh, expressed her emotions at all. She would Mm -hmm. say, baby, I'm okay, nothing's wrong, but she's sitting there crying, so I know something's wrong, right? right? So, But now it gets to the point where I say, mom, what's going on? She'll say, I don't want to talk about it right now. Okay, Respect. now we get, now we get mm-hmm. somewhere, right? Yeah. So now later on, she, we'll actually talk about it. Because I know she needs a moment to try to get it together, mm-hmm. but then we'll revisit it and she's able to express herself. Why is that? I'm not saying it's solely because I've been the one to express my feelings or speak up for, hey, mom, um, this is how this has impacted me. I would want you to do this a little bit more. But it's just it does contribute to it. Mm-hmm. So it just takes one person. And, and I'm, that's interesting that you mentioned that because, you know, when I have to meet with certain students and maybe they have some behavioral issues or they have some issues with how they are managing their emotions, mm-hmm. um, you know, what, what are y'all thoughts about how we sometimes we hyper focus on just the child and yeah. not encouraging um, family counseling? Mm-hmm. You know, All the because, time. you know, if if the child is, like we're saying, are having those issues, they're, maybe they're in an environment mm-hmm. that's not nurturing those those behaviors. Yeah. So what, what, y'all, what y'all think about that? Preach, man. Uh, me personally, I think when I was working, uh, getting my supervision for my license, uh, I was working at a, a company that uh, provided therapy to kids. And what I've seen a lot of times was the parents would bring the kids to the therapy session and then they go run errands mm-hmm. because they bring in and their mindset is fix my kid. Something's right. wrong. Mm-hmm. Something's wrong with my kid. Well, you got to think about this. I yeah. can do whatever 
therapy intervention there is with the kid. Mm-hmm. And they can respond great, perfectly, mm-hmm. and tell me and verbalize everything, but then they go back to the same environment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they do the same thing before, and then you come back, oh, no progress. Yeah, because you're not doing what I did in the therapy session mm. to help them respond that way. Mm-hmm. So I think family counseling is very important, especially when you're working with children, teens, adolescents, and things like that, because they're going to respond to the environment they're in. If it's um, safe, nurturing, <clears throat> um, being very, you know, they communicate, then they're going to respond to that. If they don't feel safe, they don't feel seen, they don't feel heard, they're going to respond to that too. And that could look like different behavioral changes yeah. in school. Um, that could look like, you know, talking back. So it just really depends on mm-hmm. what environment they're in. And I would encourage people to not give up on creating that environment. Sometimes I feel like we, you know, parents or, you know, they'll try it for a little while and mm. it's like they'll give up and because they say it's not working. It is the child. It's, it's, it's the child. You got to fix my child. Mm-hmm. But like you say, if you don't cultivate that environment, then, you know, that therapy, whatever it is, that counseling is a lost cause. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, yeah, parents, I feel like, could give up. But um, I hope this episode can be encouragement for parents to, to, to keep, you know, to, to keep educating themselves. Mm-hmm. Like I said, maybe they do need to sit in on some of those sessions, right? Mm-hmm. Or um, um, so they can learn some of those healthy practices. Uh, that, that'll help them to create that type of environment and, and to stay encouraged while doing that. Mm-hmm. I agree. And I just want to add our QD of the hour, which is our quotable data. I feel like it's very relevant. Um, mm-hmm. our, this stat is very relevant to the topic at hand. So our QD is just fun facts that you can share with your family colleagues um, and also share this episode with them as well. The best way to teach your child to react to anger appropriately is to show her how. One study showed 80% of participants in an abusive environment had trouble regulating their emotions. That's 80% compared to 37.2% of those who were not in an abusive environment. This research helps us understand how difficult home environments affect children's emotional development and highlights the importance of addressing these issues and their well-being. So what I got from this stat is that it starts at home. Mm -hmm. You know, you can take your child to a therapist and say, hey, this child is angry all the time. They're lashing out all the time. Uh, Fix it. You know, and parents often, I've seen it too, um, working with children, parents often expect the counselor or the therapist to fix it. And not only to fix the issue, the emotional issue, but to fix it quickly. Quickly. Parents are not giving, um, you know, and and this is a general statement. I'm not saying every parent, but in general, um, therapy is a long-term process. Mm -hmm. And you have to let the process um, do its job and, and do the work. But I do feel like it's so important to incorporate the family unit mm-hmm. um, yeah. in that in that process. I love that you mentioned that because uh, I love to teach kids that anger is okay. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not just the emotion, it's what we are doing with those mm-hmm. emotions yep. that I really want them to really just think about and, 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 and just think about, you know, and process because we sometimes we can get caught up with bad emotions, good emotions, but let's understand these emotions. You know, what are what's triggering those emotions and so forth and helping them understand what those triggers are. And, you know, especially with the smaller ones, you might have some buttons and these mm-hmm. this represents your triggers and so yeah. forth, you know. Um, so I think it's good for them to not for us not to label these emotions as bad mm-hmm. and understanding that, you know what, you're feeling this for a reason. You yeah. know. And that's okay. So now let's 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 reflect and see what we want to do about this. Exactly. Um, I think feelings. I, I I teach the same thing. Feelings and emotions, they're information. They're trying to tell you something, and that they're trying to tell your partner, your parent, whoever. They're trying to tell them something too. But we come, we become defensive, mm-hmm. right? So a parents could be, you better fix your face, you know. But I'm trying to. This is the way I know how to communicate, and you're not trying to understand me. Mm-hmm. Or you better lose that attitude. When me having an attitude is telling you something's wrong with this situation. So instead of you trying to understand. My why I'm why am I experiencing this emotion? You threaten me, or I get in trouble, or I get some type of consequence, or even with a partner. Instead of trying to understand where I'm coming from with this emotion, because again, I don't have to verbally communicate it, but my emotions are telling mm-hmm. you. 
you you get defensive. We have an argument, and now I don't feel again. I, I think people want to feel seen, heard, and understood. Mm -hmm. And if I don't feel those things or one of those things, then I'm going to become defensive back. Mm -hmm. And now we don't get anywhere, right? right? So I think people need to move away from, like you said, good bad emotion to is just mm -hmm. being emotion is providing information. How can I interpret this information, and then what can I do to try to fully understand it? I think people and parents should also be. We have to also learn to be patient with mm -hmm. um, with our kids, with whoever that we're dealing with too, because you're not gonna always get the answer right away, right? right. If you want to know why your face looking like that, you, you you instead of saying stop looking like that, like you mentioned, uh, I'll hold hold to that example. Instead of saying stop looking like that, you may ask. What's going on? You know, why are you looking like that? But you may not get that answer right away. Right. And so we have to be patient as well to say, okay, well, maybe we'll talk about it later, mm -hmm. right, if, if you can't give it right now. Because if you think about even us as adults, when we give answers and things in the heat of the moment while we're going, while we're going through whatever we're going through, a lot of times we're talking with our emotions and it doesn't come, come out mm -hmm. right. Mm -mm. So we, we have to be patient, I think, as, mm -hmm. as people too and know that, you know, it's not always the right time to talk about it, mm -hmm. and at least letting the child or even letting the person know. You know, these are, you know, th th these these are situations I feel like that adults go through as well yeah. with each other in relationships and you know at work, you know, mm -hmm. all throughout life. So yep. just patience is a, is a virtue. I do believe patience is very important in helping um, one ourselves process, you know, emotions and also children. I do believe patience is a virtue, um, but I also think what's important is just helping that child acknowledge what emotion they're even experiencing. Mm -hmm. Like you all said, sometimes we get wrapped up in good emotions. Oh, they're happy right now. Then the opposite of that are, you know, sad emotions. Oh, they're crying. They're mad. Um, but I do feel like in helping a child acknowledge what emotion they're actually feeling is so important so that they can start creating that pattern of what am I feeling? How can, okay, if I'm feeling nervous or anxious right now, how can I cope with that? Because those are different coping mechanisms compared to if you're feeling mad or angry. Um, so helping a child to just start to, um, acknowledge and identify those def different emotions. But I do want to pose the question, what is the difference between emotional regulation and emotional intelligence? Because I feel like this, this topic is talking about children and children regulating their emotions, but what is the difference between that emotional regulation compared to emotional intelligence? Well, I, I think with the emotional regulations, it has more to do with how we're processing their emotions. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do think there is some level of overlap. So I think this process and the reflecting, the how we're addressing it, and then the emotional intelligence is more to do with understanding, um, understanding our triggers, understanding more about their emotions, what is it telling us, and so forth, uh, what they have to do with us, what they have to do with our surroundings, and so okay. forth. Um, but I do think in in many spaces the way we use emotional intelligence um, is um, pretty all over the place, if, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So, um, but that, that's how I would define the two. Yeah, I like that. I think the more emotional intelligence you have, mm -hmm. the more you're probably able to regulate your emotions, mm -hmm. right? Because I know, I know I what's going on. Yeah. I know why it's happening. I know mm -hmm. what it's trying to tell me. That's the intelligence piece. Now, this the uh, regulation piece is what I'm going to do with it, mm -hmm. right? How I'm going to cope with it, how I'm going to manage with it, how I'm going to respond to it. Because uh, you said something earlier uh, with a, a child and anger, right? It's not about the anger. You can be mad. You can be, you know, mad at everybody, mad at the mm -hmm. teacher, mad at the principal. But what are you going to do with that anger? Mm -hmm. Now, a lot, some kids will fight. Some kids will yell. Some people, uh, some kids will throw things. You know, and that's what we try to teach them not to do those things because those things have consequences that are probably going to exacerbate the anger. Mm -hmm. So now that's where the why did you become angry in the first place? Let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. What can what is anger trying to tell you in this situation? Let's talk about that. Now we're teaching intelligence. Now what else can we do besides these uh, different behaviors that got us in trouble? Uh, that's the regulation piece. So we try to teach you know positive regulation instead of these things that have a negative uh, consequence to it. So I like what you said earlier. So can we talk a little bit about different techniques or strategies that parents can use to help their children um, regulate their mm -hmm. emotions? Yep. I think for one, 
um, that we talked about is timing. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's okay for us to let kids know that, hey, there's going to be moments where it's not the best time to talk about something. Mm -hmm. You know, we can, we can go back. You know what I'm saying? You may need 10 minutes. You may need the next day. And that's, and that's okay. Yes. So letting them know that right now may not be the best time and letting them know that it is okay if you just need that extra time or that extra day to say, hey, we'll go back to this conversation. Mm -hmm. And even as parents, it might not be the best time for us to talk mm -hmm. about it because we nope. sometimes we're right. caught in our feelings too. Mm -hmm. right? And that ain't so, good either. It ain't mm -hmm. show lane. Nope. I do, I do like what, what you uh, mentioned about timing, and it just reminds me of boundaries. Like, even yeah. when it comes to my emotions, and when I'm super sad and crying about something, I might be in the car and I might just break down crying. And I'm like, okay, obviously I cannot cry from, you know, from a drive from Charlotte to Greenwood. So giving myself a healthy boundary. You know, once this sad song finished playing, clean up your tears and let's process those emotions. Mm. I feel like that's a healthy Give thing to do. A yeah, most definitely. Um, I feel like that's a healthy thing to do with children as well. And it mm. reminds me of how some parents or even educators are now are creating and utilizing like a calming corner. Um, whereas when we were taught as kids, when we got in trouble, go sit on the stairs, you know, go, go sit in the corner away from everybody or go to your room. Even go to your room. We don't, we don't want to hear the crying. We don't want to hear the, um, we don't want to see the tears. So I feel like some individuals were taught to avoid that or, you know, were pushed away. Instead, I've seen educators and parents even use, utilizing like a calming corner where they have different um, adjective words that may describe different feelings. They have, you know, soft pillows um, that may fidget toys that may um, provide comfort or, or, you know, nurturing the child while they may be upset or while they may be sad. Um, so that is one technique that I wanted to highlight, just having a, a safe space. I'll say for a child to process their emotions. Yeah. Uh, one that I would say is uh, communication, meaning uh, on a child appropriate level. So if I'm having an issue regulating my emotions, right? There's, there's. I don't think there's a problem with letting the child on a child appropriate level, right, on their language level, letting them know that I'm having an issue right now, and it's okay that I'm having an issue. I need time mm -hmm. to now, you know, recover, and then we can talk about it. But instead of doing that, fix your face. So why, what does that say? Mm -hmm. I don't want to see you cry because it's making me feel some type of way, and I don't know how to deal with that. I don't want to deal with that. So if you fix what you're doing, I'm going to feel better. So we put the regulation of our emotions onto children, mm -hmm. onto our partners, right? Because they're doing something that's making us dysregulated and they're the problem. No, mm -hmm. the problem is I need to figure out how to communicate what I'm feeling so they can help me regulate, so we mm -hmm. can co-regulate, right? So I think communication is very important, whether that's with children, whether that's with partnerships or relationships, um, but that goes back to the emotional yeah. intelligence piece. I have to be aware of what's going on so mm -hmm. I can then communicate it so now I can regulate it. Oh, that sounded good, didn't it? <laughs> Ooh, boy! Let me mention something to y'all. So I think sometimes as people and as parents, I think we're afraid to that our child is going to get out there in the world, going to grow up, get out there in the world, start crying, be vulnerable, mm -hmm. and that somebody's going to take advantage of it, mm -hmm. right? Or they're going to be treated a certain type of way. I think that there's a fear there too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most definitely. Um, and I think that adults have trouble navigating that fear, and it's understandable in a way because... You love your child. Mm -hmm. You love your baby. Right? Did my voice get kind Yeah, you did. <laughs> I, you so did. I want to say that. I That's that seducing the mic that we so talking did. about, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but, but truly, true, true, though, I can't help it, okay? All right. But, but, uh, so if I do it again, I'm just, I'm just not going to look at you. Don't look at me. It's going to make me laugh. Uh, but, but, but truly, though, that, there's a fear there. And mm -hmm. so with that, for me, it's been important to create that safe space, right? But also find ways to let my child, make my child aware of what the world is like out there. Mm -hmm. Everybody's not going to create that safe space. And you can't go looking for a safe space for everybody, right? So that, that's been important for me because I, I know how it is out there. Mm -hmm. I know how it can be out there. Yeah. And... I just think that that's a dynamic that we want to make sure that mm -hmm. 
you know, you have to put care to that as well, right? Mm. And it ain't like throwing your child out there and saying, well, this is how it is. You no, know, it's putting care towards that as well, right? Doing that in an emotionally intelligent yeah. way. I want to validate your point because I feel like a lot of parents and um, people in previous generations were taught tough love. Mm-hmm. So we know that the mm-hmm. world is, you oh, know, yeah. a very tough place. You have to have some type of toughness um, to be able to, you know, battle life's challenges. So I do want to validate that, that you do have to have some type of edge to you to overcome um, situations in life. However, I feel like if parents equip and teach their children the necessary tools to manage to face those life challenges, Mm -hmm. then we don't have to be so worried about teaching our sons to be tough or teaching our daughters not to be vulnerable because they already have the tools inside the emotional intelligence, the emotional regulation. Um, They have a emotionally mature parent to see as a role model as to how to manage those difficult life situations in that tough world to say. Mm -hmm. Um, So I do want to validate that, you know, I feel like, the essence of it is that they were taught tough love and now they want to teach other generations like Terrence was saying tough love. Um, but that's so important. But that's why emotional regulation is so important. Important, And it really starts with the parent first. Mm-hmm. At the end, I think sometimes it's definitely tough love. And then it's sometimes people just get out there and they experience how ugly the world mm-hmm. is, right? So they want to protect. And, and, they yeah. want, and they want to protect. But to your point, you definitely have to, um, you definitely have to cultivate that. And it's like, Bring peace, but make aware. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, bring peace, but make aware. And that that definitely reminds me, if you all check out this third book um, that's listed right here, we've been talking a lot about setting boundaries and um, speaking about peace and you know emotional regulation. That just reminds me of a book that you all might want to check out. It's called Set Boundaries and Find Peace. Um, and it's, mm-hmm. it is located on... I believe, Amazon. Um, And it just speaks about how you can set boundaries within yourself, within your family, within the people around you, and how it directly brings peace. And this book is written by Miss Nedra. Beautiful. I want to mention one one quick thing that you that you was talking about as well, which I think is a powerful conversation to have with our kids. You you spoke about the fear. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to, you know, have those type of conversations with our kids Mm -hmm. that hey, you know, these are some of the things that I fear. You know, um, just being open, um, yeah. having that open conversation yeah. and saying that, hey, I, I might slip up. Right. You know what I'm saying? And I think that one of the biggest things that I really want parents to do is apologize. Mm-hmm. Say, I'm sorry. <laughs> I messed up. <laughs> owning, owning up to a mistake. Because that teaches kids to have accountability. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think that is so, so important. So, and it starts yeah. with the parents just saying, you know what? I jacked up. I mm-hmm. messed up. You know what I'm saying? Forgive me. You know? I'm going to try to get it right the next time. Mm-hmm. And I might mess up the next time, too. But you know what? I mean well. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a powerful conversation to have with our kids. I saw a TikTok. Uh, it, it was about how, okay, let's say you get in trouble. Mm-hmm. Right, like you said apologize. All right, go to your room and you know sit down or whatever. And then they come knock on your door. Oh, I think I seen that one. You want to go to the store and let me buy you something real quick? <laughs> what? <laughs> you want a cookie? You want a cookie? You know, you want you want a cupcake? You know something like yep, that? Yep. You're like what? So that is in a way that could be. I'm not saying it is, but mm-hmm. for reference in the TikTok, the TikTok was saying that's how. Parents apologize, right? <laughs> oh, let's go. You want McDonald's? No, McDonald's is my favorite food, right? So you want a happy meal? You want a happy meal? Heck yeah, I want a happy meal. So Who I guess it? things are okay now, right? That's supposed to be a signal that things are okay, but it goes back to the communication piece. You're not technically saying I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. So me hearing you say I'm sorry, I messed up, I could have done things better. Uh, this is how we can work on it. That could mean so much to that kid mm-hmm. uh, to know that okay, this is. They're admitting they're wrong. It's okay to admit you're wrong Mm -hmm. instead of just saying, let me do something to fix it because that's what that's going to lead to. When I get older, in my mind, in order to apologize or say I did wrong, I'm going to try to do something. Mm -hmm. Not say something. something. Or buy something. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to say this one too. Say Uh, it. All right. So uh, what's love got to do with it? Ike Turner. (laughs) A lot of people know about Ike. If you don't know, go watch the movie. I'm not going to tell you all about Ike. But Ike did some things to Tina that was not right. Yeah. And I remember one specific scene where he had a situation like that, threw in a room, 
And then later on in the scene, he came back with a big old box. Mm-hmm. I never said sorry, but he came back with a big old box and a big old gift. And she was laying in bed, and she just he just slid it onto her, kissed her, and walked out the room. Good example. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. So that's his way of saying, baby, I'm sorry, but he never said it. Mm-mm. And that's the way that he communicated. So we got to look at how we're communicating, what we're communicating, and is it being effective in our situation, relationship, or uh, being a parent. So And and what I hear from this situation and what I'm getting from this situation is that those silent battles or those silent situations, they accumulate over time. Oh, yeah. You know, within a span of 18 years that a child has lived with you, if you keep having those um, avoiding and not have taken accountability for those situations, it has a snowball effect and it accumulates over time and accumulates over time. And now what you have done is shown your child, you have been a role model for your child to avoid situations Mm -hmm. in life, to not regulate their emotions and not take accountability and apologize. Mm -hmm. So now it creates generational cycles. Yep, That's right. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. How y'all feeling about this episode? It's been I love this fun. topic. I, mean, I can talk about this topic mm-hmm. all day long, but I'm trying to tell you. And I I also want to add that I really appreciate the fact that you work in the school system because it's so meaningful that we um, influence and have a positive impact mm-hmm. on the next generation. Yeah. You know, Obviously, we can look at the past generations and see how they messed up, but what are we doing to leave a positive impact on the next generation? Mm-hmm. And you're you know, wholeheartedly in the field, in the environment, making a change. So kudos to you, Dominic. Most definitely. You got to have a love for it. Man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you got to have a love for it because if you don't have a love for it, you don't have a passion for it, mm-hmm. I think you're going to um, have a tendency of kind of bringing your own personal mm-hmm. stuff mm-hmm. and putting Say it onto the again. kids. Mm-hmm. You know yeah. what I'm so that's the last thing you want. You, you do not want to do. But, man, it's, it's the great experience, mm-hmm. and you can't help but to grow. You yeah. Know? And I think in this... You know, it reminds me how important it is to, you know, validate our kids. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, we think sometimes Validation. we get so caught up um, as adults, as parents, that, you know, when there's an issue, we want to just address it, you mm-hmm. know. And everybody ain't coming to us for, um, for answers. Mm-hmm. You know right. what I'm saying? We, we, we pretty much just want to get stuff out and keep it moving. Yep. And that's okay. That's what they want, you know. So, you know, with the kids, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for that space to just get stuff off, mm-hmm. to just vent, to reflect and so forth. And they'll let you know when they need some guidance. Right. They'll well, let you know. What about adults? Mm-hmm. Well, they let you know when they need guidance. I'm sometimes. That's a different story. Yeah. yeah sometimes. That's another episode, yeah. right? <laughs> and sometimes in interesting ways. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. We just kind of just kind of weed through the bushes and, and kind of figure that out. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but sometimes we don't have healthy ways mm-hmm. of saying that we need help. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where did your love for um, and your passion for the field come from? Um, I don't have an answer to that question. Okay. Um, I just know that I felt I fell into it. Mm-hmm. Um, I knew that I wanted to get into social work and the helping field. But when I got exposed to, you know, working with the youth, I said, you know what, um, I like this, mm-hmm. you know. But I just had to figure out in what aspect. So okay. mm-hmm. I didn't really understand too much about social work because it's a broad, broad field Very broad. and counseling as well. But, you know, one thing about counseling or school counseling, it has shifted so much in several mm-hmm. years. So it's no, longer, it's no longer guidance counseling, school counseling, because we actually provide counseling services. And that's something that a lot of people don't don't know, so they don't really request those type of services. But mm-hmm. um, that's that's my story. It has it been like that uniform, like throughout the country, or is it just like for the most part throughout the country? Um, so, but there's been you know there's been a, multiple shifts. Uh, we don't just focus on on the records and so forth. And I know on a high school level, there's a lot of career development and so forth. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Sounds good. Well, you're doing great work. Um, just want to give you yeah. your props, you know, while you're on the episode. Appreciate that it. You're definitely doing great work in our community, and we appreciate it. Appreciate yes, sir. Appreciate it. Yeah. We appreciate you for being here, too. Uh, Mr. Yes. Dominique Barn. That's definitely right. Appreciate you, brother. Appreciate uh, it. Dope th- topic. Uh, yeah, I think you brought a lot of dope topic, and I think you brought a lot of light and, mm-hmm. you know, just like a lot of great information to the episode, too, man. Yes. So we, we really do appreciate you being here, man. We got to have you back. We love to have you back with us. Anytime. Yeah, and we appreciate everyone out there for Thank being with all. us as well. Um, for being with us on this journey. It's our journey. It's your journey. It's everybody's journey Mm -hmm. um, to better mental health, right? So we appreciate you. We hope that through this episode, you found some little nuggets, right, 
uh, just some things to help you out um, on your day, um, you know, your week, your life, right? And not just to help you out, but to help someone else out too. In this episode, we're talking about our kids, uh, obviously uh, helping out our kids, but even, you know, just helping out whoever that we can through some of these strategies that we talked about today. Uh, so we hope, we hope that you found it uh, refreshing. And we hope that you'll join us again. Come on back. We'll, we'll be with you um, uh, pretty soon. What, another two weeks? Be with you in another two weeks. So uh, so check in with us again. It's your host, Joshua. You all take care. Until next time, my name is Hannah Williams. And it's Dominique Bond. And Terrence Dawkins. And remember, if you need anything, do not text Josh because he's not going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Until next this. time, y'all. <laughs> See y'all later.